And that's where Jordan Peterson comes in because he was a professor at Toronto who probably would have stayed a professor at Toronto and been a person of no note until Bill C-16 came along in Canada, right? Most people probably know this. Jordan Peterson rose to fame by contesting and refusing to adhere to Bill C-16 in Canada, both academically, because he thought it was threatening his tenure, as well as he thought it was just an infringement on his freedom of speech. For those who don't know, Bill C-16 has basically added transgender and gender expressionism into Canadian hate crime laws. So it makes it illegal to commit hate crimes to people who fall under those categories, as well as the previous categories that were already under the hate crime laws. Right. That includes, and is most importantly, genocide. So you cannot commit actions that will result in the genocide of those people. I know. (laughs) And you can also not commit uh, actions that will incite violence or, uh, you know, hate speech. No, and, and it's not like Jordan Peterson was advocating that. He was not. Not in not any way. But he misinterpreted it to believe that he would now be forced to use multiple gender pronouns in class. And that yes. he could be charged with a crime yes. if he doesn't refer to people uh, as Z or Zer or Zem or any of the other, I think, No, you say, like, he was mistaken. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I've always wondered, like, was he honestly mistaken? Like, I feel like he, he was 100% mistaken. But you think, like, I don't think it was mistaken so much. It was a calculated move on his part to, uh, to, 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 to his garner profile. attention. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that is very true, actually. Like, he was yeah. wrong, obviously. Obviously. Like, right. Yeah. Okay. You're saying on, on paper he's wrong, but that was a very good move on his yeah. part to gain prominence. Yes. Yeah. And part of that is that you know it it obviously resonated with a lot of people. I mean, initially transphobic people, but it, it grew and grew to anti PC culture people. Yeah. And it it was helped by the fact that students were protesting him. Students were becoming everything they ever accused the left of being. Yeah. Just screaming names at him, uh, demanding he not speak, silencing his speech. And that exploded all the way until he was, you know, he had YouTube videos explaining the same thing. Those exploded as well. He opens a Patreon. Patreon starts getting thousands of donations. He gives like three hour speech on YouTube, which obviously yep. gets a lot of listeners and views. Absolutely resonates you know, with a lot of people. He's giving like free academic, uh, not academic, but very. No, they are academic. Like I said, we, you, got, you got to reflect upon the fact that he is an academic. But a lot of his speeches and his lectures aren't based in the psychology that he would teach in, an, in a psychology course. Well, okay, course, so right? that, that's that's why I want to say this. Jordan Peterson is a gateway drug. <laughs> he is a gateway drug into Christian conservative ideas. Like if I told you, Dave, there is a prominent intellectual who is giving speeches and rallies around the world right now who's talking about forced monogamy Uh, talking about transphobia, homophobia, talking about all these ranges of issues, talking about cultural Marxism under the guise of postmodernism, you would say, who is this radical, insane person I haven't heard of? And why does he have such a platform? Yeah. Right? That would be the first thing you said. No one thinks that of Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson is so innocuous when he first starts out because Jordan Peterson, for a large amount of what he does says some good things and makes a lot of sense. Basic stuff, yeah. Well, basic stuff, but even... (laughs) But even before you get into that kind of stuff, if you just watch a specific Jordan Peterson lecture or speech that resonated with you, for example, for me, someone had once sent me, uh, this was before he became famous, a speech where he was talking about artists. And Jordan Peterson talks about how the mind of an artist, he's like, artists who want to go out there in the world and live off the careers, take the biggest risk reward gamble of any profession. Because the percentage of people who can live off their art is a fraction, right? Like, but the reward is very large because you get to live off your creative abilities. The other aspect you want to say is the psychology of that is any artist I've ever talked to or met has an innate desire to have to get that out of them. And that's part of what makes an artist. And when I saw that, I was like, this is awesome. That resonates with me. This is a great speech. And I probably want to hear some more, right? And that might be the one that resonates with me, with someone else or a lot of these young white males and these aimless boys, right? It happens to be his his 12 steps where it's clean your room, stand up straight, be a lobster. But I'm just saying these innocuous rules that are just self-help guru bullshit yeah. resonate with people, especially people... I'm going to say this. There is a large percentage of young white males who feel disenfranchised by society. I don't know what we're doing. <laughs> when, they're, when they're being told by people that uh, you have privilege, you have white privilege, and you still suck. Like I still, it's live, true. But I still live in my parents' basement, and I'm told by everyone that I have every privilege in society. You I'm, suck. I, I'm a straight heterosexual male. I'm supposed to have all these advantages, yeah. And yet, I'm ostracized by society now because everyone's saying that we live in a patriarchy. There's systemic racism. All this other PC social justice warrior bullshit. I I, I feel isolated. 
Yeah. I've, I've now found an intellectual who has a, a platform who is a very intelligent person in one respect in the realm of psychology yes. and only psychology. And because of that, I now have something that I can attune myself to. I can now read his books and I can talk in the dinner table with my other family members yes. about. <laughs> I'm not a failure. It's women who put on makeup that are failures. And. Once I get into Jordan Peterson, I get pulled into his dark stuff. Uh, you get pulled into... Not me. <laughs> but I'm not white, so I... <laughs> you also don't subscribe to him. But I'm saying these people, right? That's when you get pulled into the ideas of uh, patriarchy isn't real, that uh, there should be systems of forced monogamy. Uh, okay, before I even get into the postmodern and, and cultural Marxist stuff, that's the point I want to end on. Like, the sexist and the sexism stuff, that, that to me, the first time I ever saw that interview on Vice that he gave, where he's talking about... Why do women wear lipstick in the workplace? And I'm just asking questions. Why do women wear lipstick in the workplace? Because they want to have sex. <laughs> He's, I, and, and, you know, he doesn't have a straight answer. He's like, I don't know, but I'm just saying, why would they do that? Why would anyone do that? The red lipstick denotes sexuality. It it, it 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 represents the flushing of the cheeks. It's It's why people would want to find you sexually appealing. Why would women do that? You know, excluding the societal pressure that women have in order to you know, sorry, uh, operate in society. You know what, what's richest about this? That motherfucker has hair plugs. Why the fuck do you yes. have hair plugs? <laughs> right? Where is it not the same fucking thing? Yeah, and why do you wear uh, like suits with shoulder pads in them? Yeah. Doesn't that denote sexuality? Isn't that supposed to show a broader shoulder, a more masculine yeah. sexual oh, appeal? It's okay for me to do that because it's <laughs> men who need to do that. Also, Frozen is terrible. <laughs> I'm just going to read something that not a lot of people, I think, know about. So this was a question asked to Jordan Peterson on Quora. If you could write a rule book for being a man, what man law would you write? What are the qualities of a good husband, father, or brother? A lot of these are just lovely things that we both would assume, right? Uh, encourage children through play. Promote the best in people. Keep the sacred fire burning. What? <laughs> Guard the women and children from harm. Confront the eternal adversary. Build the crystal palace. See, like we're already getting into some weird Christian uh, theology here. Confront death with courage in return. Offer your sons up as a sacrifice to God. Yeah. It's, 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 it's weird, weird. You know, like you don't need context there. What the f does that mean? <laughs> that is biblical. <laughs> it's like it's it's basically one of those things where an intellectual of one kind of discipline comes out and then sort of approaches the rest of the world with. With that. Yeah. It's no different than when he had that interview with Jim Jeffries yeah. and was basically stymied by a very simple concept about uh, denying people service. And he's like, well, what happens if you're in deny, you know, denying gay people is the same thing as denying black people? Yeah. And he's like, oh, I never thought about that. And it's yeah. like, I mean, the most basic academic should be able to figure that. Either you're being willfully ignorant of it or you are just a fraud. Or you harbor a prejudice. Of which you don't want to admit. Ever since that BLC 16 thing, it was, yeah, it was yeah. directly evident. I, I it wasn't about that. I definitely right? think he's like anti-trans, anti-gay and stuff. But I think for the most part, as a, like a, as a sociological kind of figure, he's a charlatan. Yes. He's a brilliant, say, psychologist. Yeah. But his like depth of history and sociology is pretty pathetic. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I don't I think he knows that. He's yeah. just on the wave of getting rich. Right? I, so, I, I disagree. I, I don't think he knows that. <laughs> I think he does. I think there's a reason. I think he, he has never... I don't, I, don't think he's a, I don't think he's a charlatan in that sense. I think he believes his convictions. I think like, that's he, not something that could love you against. I, I I think he's extends himself far beyond what he actually believes because he makes him s filthy rich now. Well, yeah, it does, um, it does make him filthy rich. You know, know, like like he has tacitly said one thing negative against Donald Trump, yeah. and I feel like in closed quarters he would no, say, no, no, yeah. he, he is he, no, he he's he's said things that actually I would say endorse Donald Trump from time to time. Yeah, but he I, skirts the line. He skirts the line on a lot of things. Like you know, I feel that he personally like. This is my own projection. Well, this entire show is an editorial. <laughs> yes. But I feel like in behind closed doors, you'd be like, yeah, Donald Trump's terrible. But in public, he would never say that because his Patreon supporters and all his, like, all the people, chuds who follow him are Donald Trump supporters. That's mm -hmm. his base that gets mm -hmm. him rich. Yeah. Okay. I might agree with you there, but I wouldn't agree that that extends to his views on, you know, truth, epistemology, uh, no, and, no, like, history, yeah. and, and stuff like that. I, th I think he genuinely believes that there are the these dragon of chaos. <laughs> So the final point I want to talk about Jordan Peterson, and this is one that always irked me about him ever since like we were forced to start learning about the guy so much. He always uses the term postmodernists and talking about the postmodernists and how they're trying to destroy culture. 
part of the leftists and the aggressive left regime is these postmodernists who hate uh, industrialization, capitalism, the benefits that come therein, and all that kind of stuff. And there's times when he would slip in the words neo-Marxist, and he has recently started occasionally mentioning cultural, cultural Marxism. Marxism. Now, here's a little bit of history. Cultural Marxism is a term that's been around for some time now. It was used by the Nazis as a way of scapegoating the Jews. You know, that there was a Jewish conspiracy. I do not think in any way that, you know, he's referring to that as, as when he says cultural Marxism or, or when he talks about postmodernism, he's not referring to it in the same way that... Uh, you know, alt-right and racists or nationalists referred into it. Yeah. He could be referring to it in the way that, you know, they refer to it from the Frankfurt School. But when it, when it comes to that, I think he should be culturally aware of what the, the gravity of cultural Marxism and the term cultural Marxism and the idea that it historically has been used to scapegoat the Jews uh, holds, especially when you have a platform like you do, right? So whether or not you want to say cultural Marxism or shadow it with the, the term postmodernism, which I'll get to in a point, in Nazi Germany, it used to be known as the term Kulturbolschewismus. <laughs> Kulturbolschewismus. <laughs> Apologies to our German listeners. <laughs> and the the same term was used during the Red Scare and uh, the Cold War to uh, basically out communists, right? It was the same idea. They are cultural Marxists, cultural Bolsheviks, yeah. uh, as they were called at the time. The, it's been a long going pattern. Yeah. of this and now he has found this new guise of calling it postmodernism it's not, yeah sorry yeah postmodernism yeah. well no I, I think I think postmodernism is an evolution of the same um, concept of yeah. the same scapegoating yes that very quickly if you want to ask what, what is postmodernism postmodernism like it's a philosophy of thought that came out after World War II after the atrocities of the World War especially by all these French philosophers um, like Foucault it, it, it's a reactionary response to what you experience and see its end result is often nihilism which of course I, I just witnessed uh, the, the genocide of six million Jews I witnessed some atrocities. I, I lived through one of the most horrific barbaric experiences in history. Yes, you were going to have a reactionary result to that. That That is the postmodernism movement. I don't think any progressive or leftist or Democrat or liberal in today's society adheres to that. I or, do. <laughs> or thinks about that when they're thinking about what they're doing day to day, right? That's why my political <laughs> career never got off the ground. <laughs> Here's Red Foucault. <laughs> Crickets. <laughs> like I said, that that's part of what I find is the the dark side of Jordan Peterson and, and the side that people unfortunately don't know what they're getting pulled into when they read both Rules of Life or any of his other books or, or Maps of Meaning. I right? feel like if you read his books, you're not really gonna get pulled into that. But it's like you read his books, then you delve into his. The seminars, words. right, where yeah. he talks about how white privilege isn't real and, you know, there isn't such a thing as the patriarchy, um, things like that. If you already subscribed to him as a, as a guru or a prophet, you'll get sucked into these other ideas, right? And these other ideas happen to be slightly or sometimes extremely right wing. He is the alt-right and the white nationalist movement's academic du jour. Well, of course, but he's also centrist academic du jour. He's also rationalist. Well, some rationalists. Yeah. The white power. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and the final thing I want to say is if we're talking about maps of meaning, anyone who hasn't read it, read Nathan J. Robinson's basically dissection of Jordan Peterson's books. He's done the, the hard work that you don't need to because maps of meaning and his other literature is frankly incomprehensible in a lot of ways. And I'm not saying that in the sense that he might not know what he's talking about, but he is the master of word salad. If you take any Jordan Peterson quote, you will find the word axiom, Carl Jung, and some other things muddled into it there with the lobster hierarchy and other stuff. But as Nathan J. Robinson will point out to you, he can dissect what Jordan Peterson is trying to say. And oftentimes it is very basic stuff. And it is wrapped in this word salad that makes it sound way more intellectual and way more above brow than it is. <laughs> and for the record, Carl Jung, which is Jordan Peterson's hero, uh, was Sigmund Freud's partner back in the day, who turned out to have quite a few anti-Semitic and racist beliefs. Wow. Uh, <laughs> which, you know, isn't surprising for German living through World War II. But he also put them into his psychoanalysis. And, uh, you know, I will also say as a footnote, he was helping the Allies by the end of the war and became yeah. a fervent anti- Oh, surprise, surprise yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> German intellectual who's helping the Allies by the end of the war. And by 1948 was uh, firmly opposed 
rules to Nazism. Yeah. Uh, good timing on that one. Yeah. Wait, 1948? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. After, three years after the fall of Nazis. Oh, I'm so, suddenly no longer a Nazi. Oh, you guys are hanging people on your armor. <laughs> the Nazis are terrible people. I actually helped the Allies by <laughs> psychoanalyzing uh, Hitler for you, <laughs> which that was his contribution. <laughs> the most he useless. crazy. <laughs> yeah. He hated the Jews. Yeah. I don't think he likes Jews very much. <laughs> Money, please. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Sam's like, here you go. <laughs>